All right, hi everyone again. So this is Falin, and for my part, I'll be sharing with you guys on uh, the China financials, which we believe is a key pillar in China's economic growth story. So we all know that global financials had a great run since late last year, but uh, China financials is one of the rare few laggards within this space. So while we think that global financials remains to be an attractive uh, category that investors should, con should consider, we think that China financials is an even more attractive space from a total potential return perspective. So like what we have uh, shared earlier on, the financial sector plays a very important role in any economy and almost everyone in every industry is highly interconnected with the financial sector. And for the China's financial sector, it is largely dominated by two industries. First is the banking industry and second is the insurance companies. So uh, just to reiterate again, the banking industry generally refers to the financial intermediaries that connect savers and borrowers, whereas the insurance companies, they're the ones that offer risk management products to their customers and collect premiums from them in return. So for this presentation, we have decided to split it into two segments. First, we'll be sharing about the Chinese banks, then we'll move on to the Chinese, industry, Chinese insurance industry. So looking ahead into 2021 and beyond, we have identified three key catalysts that will drive the Chinese bank's earnings and share price. So first is the easing loan loss provision. Second is a double digit loan growth. And third is a new re-rating catalyst uh, that might be underway for the Chinese big four banks. So first of all, Chinese banks are uh, similar to the other global banks. They had to set aside large amount of reserves due to the pandemic last year as they prepare themselves for a wave of bad debt. So unsurprisingly, loan loss provisions became the main culprit that dragged down on the Chinese bank's earnings for uh, the financial year 2020. But as mentioned earlier, uh, loan loss provision is something that's more forward looking. So most of the Chinese banks have front loaded their loan loss provisions in the first half of 2020. And in fact, we have also observed that their loan loss provision have started to taper off since the third quarter last year. So as provisions return to the normal levels in the next two years, we believe that this will help to support the bank's overall earnings and hence their valuations. Next, we have also identified strong loan growth as another key catalyst. So um, we believe that PBOC is not likely to conduct any rate hikes uh, in the near term or perhaps in the next one to two years. So we can expect to see rather flattish net interest margins across the Chinese banks. And at the same time, PBOC has also announced that they want new loans to stay around 2020 levels, which means to say uh, we can expect to see new loans to grow, fat, to grow at 11 to 12% for this year and perhaps the next year. So at this point, I think some investors, you may be concerned over the fact that the Chinese regulator seems to be trying to tighten uh, the credit market. But we just want to highlight and say that you can still expect to see a double-digit loan growth across the Chinese banks and will believe that this, will, this is in fact a catalyst for the Chinese banks. So this double-digit loan growth will help to offset the impact of a flattish net interest margins, which will help to support the Chinese banks' net interest income and hence earnings. And from a longer term perspective, we have also identified a, a few new rebating catalysts that might be underway for the Chinese big four banks. So as the name suggests, the big four banks uh, refers to the four largest uh, banks in China. And just these four banks alone, they take up almost 40% of the entire market share. And from the chart on the left, you can see that the Chinese big four banks have consistently traded at a much lower valuation as compared to their international peers since uh, uh, for the last five years. And we believe that this could be due to uh, several reasons like a lack of research coverage, a uh, lack of market transparency in China, as well as a lack of diversified revenue stream. But as China commits to open up its financial market, we believe that this valuation gap could start to narrow. And why is that so? Maybe let me give you a quick uh, background brief of, the, brief of this situation. So for more than two decades, investment banking and other security services in China were off limits to most commercial banks. And this was put in place by the 1995 Commercial Bank Law, uh, given how the government was uh, concerned that there might be some crossover risk across this uh, entire financial system. But to better prepare its domestic firm to compete against foreign banks, 
Chinese regulators are planning to start a trial to break down the wall that is separating the banks and the securities firms. So Tsai Xing, a Chinese media group, recently reported that the Chinese regulators may grant at least two security licenses to the large commercial banks, and it seems like ICBC and China Construction Bank may be the two candidates that will kickstart this trial. And this is unsurprising given how securities firms in China pale in comparison to their foreign rivals by almost all measures. So you can see that the Chinese top four security firms is way smaller as compared to its top four foreign rivals, which are uh, Goldman Sachs, UBS, Morgan Stanley, and Credit Suisse. So therefore, we believe that when such reform is pushed through, we do expect to see a re-rating in the Chinese Big Four Bank share prices because not only are their business model becoming more diversified thanks to additional revenue stream, but the opening up of financials, a China financial market will also improve market transparency, hence attracting new investors who were previously uncomfortable with this issue. Now, for better understanding of Chinese banks, we will move on to the Chinese insurance industry. So right now, Chinese insurance industry is the world's second largest insurance market, but we still see huge room for growth for the Chinese insurance market. And similar to the Chinese banks, we have identified three key catalysts that will support the Chinese insurance uh, company's earnings. Number one is the growing aging population. Number two is the rising middle class population. And number three is the low insurance penetration rate uh, in China. So first of all, the growing aging population. So over the last decade, you can see that uh, the proportion of aging population has been increasing, and we believe that this will continue in the next couple of years. So this increasing aging population highlights two big, uh, two big concerns. Number one is whether these elderly have enough savings after retirement, and number two is whether these elderly have enough long-term care for their medical expenses in the future. And at this point, aging population is still very reliant on government and family support for their expenses. <clears throat> and we all know that healthcare expenses is just going to keep climbing up uh, in the next couple of years, and we can always expect significant out-of-pocket payments. So this seems to suggest that cash from savings and the government may not be the most appropriate long-term solution to tackle this growing aging population. On top of that, people are also living longer, and plus the lingering effect of one-child policy will exacerbate the problem of a growing aging population and place further economic strains on families with elderly members. So in light of this challenge, we believe that insurance, which only accounts for 2% of the aging wallet, can take on a bigger role when it comes to retirement planning. And therefore, this represents a great opportunity for the Chinese insurers to grow their market share, to, get, to win more uh, gross return premiums and hence uh, providing a level of support for their earnings. Next, we have also identified the huge and fast-growing middle class population as another uh, catalyst for the Chinese insurers. So as consumers get wealthier and as their living standards start to improve, demand for better medical care increases as well. And according to a survey conducted by EY, it was concluded that wealthier Chinese consumers tend to purchase more private insurance, uh, given how the public insurance coverage is insufficient to cover their climbing healthcare costs. And from the chart, you can also observe that as the Chinese consumers display disposable income increases, the amount spent, the proportion of disposable income spent on insurance premium increases as well. So therefore, we believe that the fast-growing middle-class population will spur long-term demand for insurance products, and this will translate to higher gross return premiums and earnings for the Chinese insurers in the coming years. And finally, while the previous two uh, points that we have shared earlier on suggest that demand for insurance in China is present, you will still be surprised to know that many citizens in China remain severely underinsured. So level of insurance penetration and insurance density in China remains low as compared to some of its international peers like uh, US, Hong Kong, or even Singapore. 
So insurance penetration refers to the gross return premiums as a percentage of a country's GDP, whereas the insurance density refers to how much the people in a country spends on insurance in terms of uh, amount of premium. And for China, its insurance density is only at 430 USD, whereas the average of its other peers it stands at about 3,500 USD, which is almost 10 times larger than what it is in China. So this clearly signals a significant amount of unmet demand for insurance, and we believe that this is where Chinese insurance can catch up and take up more market share, which will once again help to provide a, a growth in their gross return premiums and as well as their earnings. So all in all, we believe that there's a lot of tailwind that will continue to support the China financial sector. And more importantly, at this juncture, valuations of the China financial sector remains undemanding. So to gain exposure to the China financial sector, our recommended ETF is the Global X MSCI China Financials ETF with a ticker code CHIX. So this index, or this ETF, is largely made up of the banks and insurance, which is why we have decided to split our presentation, focusing on these two industries. So on the other hand, let's say you wish to gain exposure specifically to the China banking industry. Our recommended ETF is the BMO Hong Kong Bank ETF with the ticker code 3143. So for this, the big four Chinese banks pick up almost 50% of the index, and another of our stock pick, HSBC, is the, one of the top 10 holdings of this ETF. So in conclusion, here are our two ideas if you wish to gain exposure to the China financial sector as well as the Chinese banking sector, industry, sorry. So just uh, bear in mind, BMO Hong Kong Bank's ETF will be renamed to China AMC Hong Kong Bank's ETF, effective on the 20, 28th of May this year. And with that, I've come to the end of my presentation. Thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, if you have any questions, feel free to type it in the Q&A uh, box and we will try to answer as many of them as possible. Thank you.